So today we're starting a new series called New Normal, and I want to ask you to do me a favor. Um, this is a series that applies to everybody, because I don't know if you noticed, but we're in a pandemic. Anybody notice? We're in a pandemic, and we're all in the same boat. And so this is one of the few times in history that we have to speak to something that everybody's going through. And so this is an incredible opportunity to invite someone to church. And it's very, very simple. You go on our Facebook page, and at the top we have pinned an invite. We've made this a Facebook event, and all you have to do is invite people to to the event, invite them to come to church in person if they're comfortable doing that, share the link. So I want to ask you to do that, and that way you will plant a seed of hope in this If you're watching online, you don't have to be in the building to do that. You're connected online. So go online and, and share and invite and Um, This is a series that I know will be relevant to to everybody. Uh, So, the new normal. I I, I don't know if you felt, well, I say I know, you felt this. I know you felt this. At some point in this catastrophe, you've had that feeling, you know, this is not normal. I don't know if you've said it yet. Matter of fact, why don't you go ahead and say it? It'll make you feel better. This is therapy. This is group therapy. This is not normal. It's not normal. Like what we're doing right now, this is absolutely normal. Not normal. But that does beg a question, what really is normal? John Ortberg wrote a book, and here's the title. He said, everybody's normal until you get to know them. You thought your wife was normal until you got married. You thought your husband was normal until you got married, right? And then you see that other side, and you go, man, they're weird. No, they've always been weird. You just didn't know it. Everybody's normal until you get to know them. I've heard this a hundred times if I've heard it once. When are things going to get back to normal? And I don't know about you, but I'm ready for some normalcy in my life. Are you ready? Anybody ready? I'm ready for some normalcy in my life. I mean, I just think about, you know, like sports. Like, I'm ready for SEC football to start. I don't want to wait till September 26th. I don't want to. I was watching an NBA game last night. And they had the fans piped in through virtual reality or some other thing I don't understand, mashed on screens in like plexiglass up by the gym floor. They're not tricking me. They're not there. Who are they tricking? They're not tricking anybody. I watched that. I went, that's not basketball. So I flipped it over and I watched a cornhole tournament. (laughs) Come on now. And then I thought, what is this that's taken over ESPN? I flipped over and watched foosball. Can I tell you something? When you're watching foosball on ESPN, this is not normal. Something is wrong with the whole world when foosball is what you're zeroing. And I actually started cheering for a guy. I got to turn it. I got to turn it. I can't be a foosball. Like, I don't even know how you dress. I can't be that guy. I'm ready for some normalcy. I'm tired of mask. I hope I never see a mask again as long as I live. Anybody tar- uh, this is just for me. I mean, you, you're like, why did I come? You came to help me. That's why you're here today. I'm tired of masks. I'm tired of statistics. Like, I generally enjoy statistics. I'm done with them. I don't want to know what the percentage of this and that and the other thing is. I don't want to walk around the little guardrail to get in Walmart. I want to walk straight in the door. I'm tired of walking around it. How about you? I don't want another COVID update. And please, for the love of all that's good, don't give me another conspiracy theory. If you found out who really started it, I don't care. I don't want to know. Unfriend me on Facebook. I'm done with it. I don't want to know who started COVID. I don't want the government. I don't want all that. I don't want to hear any more of that. It's amazing how we don't know how much we need normal till it's gone. And then you say, man. I wish things would get back to normal. And that's funny because I remember some of you complaining about your life before. I'm so busy and I'm stressed and I'm tired and I have anxiety and I don't sleep good and I have fear. And that's what you want to get back to? Wait, wait, wait. It's so easy to want normal, but what if normal is it backward? What if it's forward? What if the normal we want back there is not the normal God is leading us to out there? See, we assume normal's back, 
But God is moving forward. The God who specializes in resurrection and new beginnings and moving from strength to strength isn't moving us back to nothing. He's moving us forward to something if you can hear it. Hey, I came to preach to you today. Are you ready? God has a word for us in the middle of this chaos and uncertainty. It's okay to look back, but don't go back. I hope certain things do go back to normal. Like how many of you have kids in school? Jesus, please, you don't have to fix everything. Just fix the schools, please. They have to go back. In Jesus' name, they have to go back. Please, God. We can intercede on that, please. These teachers are so underpaid now. It's a miracle. They're so underpaid. You know, we took them for granted now. Oh, Jesus, please open the school. There's some things that I hope they do go back to normal, but there's some other things I hope they never go back to normal. What if what, if what you thought was normal was just what you were used to? What if it wasn't normal? This is the, the opportunity for us to rebuild our life the way God always wanted it. If you can hear. So this series is for the business leader here who says, I don't know how to run a business now. This series is for people who are facing uncertainty and don't know what to do. This series is for people who've lost something that maybe you're never going to get back. This series is for Kingwood Church, who God gave a vision to be a movement of hope to, but it's just going to look different than we thought it was. So what's the new normal we should look forward to? Exodus chapter 14. Let me give you the background before we jump into the story. 430 years of slavery is what these people had been in. 400, that's older than America. 430 years ago, America wasn't a nation. You think we have an established culture. What do you think a culture would be of slavery for 430 years? Nobody can remember being free. Nobody can remember. It's normal to be a slave because that's all we've ever known. Generations can't remember being free. They hated it. They hated it. It frustrated them. It limited their freedom. They lived in fear, but it was normal. And one of the things they got used to is never having enough. Man, that, that thought resonates with me because I think that's the spirit of the age we live in. We don't ever have enough. We don't ever have enough. I don't, I don't, I don't know how to have enough information. 24-7 news cycle. Turn the news back on. Turn it back on. Look on Facebook. Look on social media. Look on Instagram. Look on Snapchat. See what your friends are doing. See what everybody else is doing. Get another article. Get another report. It's popping up on your screen everywhere. Informa can't get enough information. Your heart and mind was not designed by God to hold this much. But we keep jamming it in anyway. Not enough connection. Oh, have you downloaded the new app? It's a new way to connect with friends and send videos and send pictures. And somehow the more appified we get, the less connected we feel. The less we know how to relate to a real person. Not enough. Not enough experiences. Oh, have you gone and driven the new NASCAR? Have you gone to the new place? Have you gone seen the new boat or the new beach or the new resort or the new this? Or the, never enough experience. Never enough. That's the spirit of the age we live in. And we've gotten used to it. We've gotten used to not having enough sleep. Just going, going, grinding, driving. Not enough uh, overspending. In debt. Over committing. Over busy. Overworking, frantic. We got used to it. Some of you discovered some things you didn't know, like dinner at the table with your family. You, you, so there, I guarantee you, somebody in there was some time you said, I hope this lasts a little longer. Because I kind of enjoying sitting here looking across the table at my kids when we were running from ball field to ball field to ball field, losing our mind trying to eat pizza for dinner every night. There's something kind of good about this. Never enough, never enough. We lived in a culture where it was okay to mistreat people because of their race. There's a young man in our church who was at Walmart a few months ago 
And a lady came down the aisle with a cart and she said, I'm not going to go down the same aisle as, a, and she used the N word. That happened to a guy in our church. Is that the normal you want to get back to? Don't tell me it was, hey, maybe it wasn't as good as we thought. Maybe there were some things going on that we needed to deal with all along. These people had been in slavery for 430 years. God raised up a leader named Moses to send them to Pharaoh to say, let my people go. He sent seven plagues behind him, and after seven plagues, Pharaoh changed his mind and said, okay, you can, you can go. So the children of Israel, God's people, moved to the, to the Red Sea. They are camping on the bank of the Red Sea, and Moses, um, uh, Pharaoh changes his mind. And he says, you know what? All my free labor is gone. Hey, here's just a side note for you, okay? Everybody's not going to celebrate your freedom because some people benefit from your bondage. So don't expect the whole world to come out and clap when you find freedom because some people are benefiting from it and they don't want you to be free. But God's people will celebrate it because God's people walked in bondage and then they came in freedom and they know the feeling. So here's what you have Pharaoh changes his mind and says, Let's go, let's go get the free labor. So Pharaoh leads his army to bring God's people back into slavery. Exodus 14, 10. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and, they, and, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. Look, watch this. They were, they were terrified and cried out to the Lord. I want you to remember that. We'll look at that again in a minute. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to die? Those were all the graves full? And that's really a sarcastic thing to say because Egypt was known for its graves. Of course there were graves. So they're being sarcastic. They're mad. They're frustrated. What have you done to us by bringing us out to Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than die in Egypt. So here's what happens. They're trapped between Pharaoh and his army and bondage and slavery in the Red Sea. They're trapped between them. They have no context for this challenge. They've never been here before. Boy, that sounds like us. We have no... None of you are alive in 1916, were you, with the Spanish flu? Anybody? No. We have no context for this challenge. We've never been here before. And we're trapped between, here's Pharaoh coming down with his army, and here's an uncrossable Red Sea. We're trapped between them. What do you do? What do you do when you're trapped at this point? And, the, and here's, what, here's what they did. They started to cry out, and they said, hey, we were better off in Egypt. We were better off in Egypt. They would rather be enslaved in Egypt than live with freedom in uncertainty. Can I tell you, that reminds me of a lot of people today. Because you know why? Freedom's scary. You know why it's scary? Because there's no certainty. Freedom. Nobody to blame. Can't be anybody else's responsibility. It's mine. Why? I'm free. You see, it takes courage to be free. It takes courage to live free. It takes courage to embrace grace. It takes courage to embrace God. Because now all the chains are off. It's not what they did to me or this one did to me or my parents did to me or where I come from. I'm free. Man, I'm healed. I'm free. Man, freedom takes some courage. Pressure and uncertainty. There's a point of frustration that comes between the pressing army of Pharaoh and the Red Sea. Look back at uh, Exodus 14.10. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching. They were terrified. And so here's what they did. Watch. They cried out to the Lord. We cry out when we get frustrated. Sometimes our cries sound like their cries. They sound like complaints. I complain sometimes. You ever do that? God, I came here to pray, but if I'm honest, I got some issues with you. Well, why is my wife still sick? Why? Why? How long? How long are we going to go through this? How long is this going to last? Where are you at? Why, when I look across the horizon of my life, can I not see any sign of you moving at all? Why? 
That's what happens. When you get mashed down, when you get pressed, what comes out is some complaining sometimes. You're crying out. You're crying out, right? Frustration, here's the thing though. Frustration leads you to God. You might cry the wrong way. You might lash out. You might complain. You might turn to some pills or food or drink or try to medicate. The method that you use to cry out might be bad, but the cry's good. The cry's good. Don't mistake the method that you use to cry out for the message of the cry. Hear the cry. Follow the cry. The cry will lead you to God. I think there's been this cry swelling up for a long time. We couldn't hear it because we got too comfortable. We got our life the way we wanted it. That's why we want to go back. Because I finally, I worked all these years, and I did all this, and I put things in. And you know what? At least it was controllable. At least it was certain. At least it was comfortable. At least it's the way I wanted it. We got set in our ways. We got buried in our culture. That's why we want to go back. Romans 8, 18. Let's look at the, this cry for a minute. Let's unpack the nature of this cry for a minute. Paul said it like this, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. What is the present suffering? It's the point of frustration. What's the future glory? It's the cry for another reality. It's a cry for another kingdom. Romans 8, 21. Let's look at these cries. This morning, most of this message was intro to the series. Now I'm going to wrap it up and I'm going to give you three quick thoughts, if you're taking notes, about the cry that, that, is, that can be heard if we'll listen. Here it is, Romans 8, 21, that the creation itself will be liberated, here we go again, freedom, from its bondage to decay and brought into freedom and the glory of the children of God. This is a cry to be liberated from bondage and brought into freedom. Verse 22, we know, watch this, that the whole creation has been groaning, has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. So here's the first cry. The first cry is the cry of creation. The cry of creation. You know creation knows its creator. It's just people who get confused about that. Creation's not confused about that. So in creation, we see storms, and we see earthquakes, and we see hurricanes, and we see nature crying out, longing to be set free from this broken cycle and system that we're all subject to. So this thing that God created called nature cries and groans and moans and longs to be set free from the burden and pressure of brokenness. Romans 8 says it's like labor pains. And nature is willing to endure it because like a woman in labor, you'll go through the pain because you know the joy that's coming. Verse 23. Let's look at the second cry. Not only so, so there's the cry of nature, not only so, we ourselves who have the first fruits, remember that word, first fruits, of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our body. What is this first fruit? When you become a believer, God puts the Holy Spirit inside you. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is there, and He is producing what Galatians calls the fruit of the Spirit, the first fruits. It is an appetizer. It whets your appetite for the full meal. And that's what our relationship with God is on this earth. It's an appetizer. It stirs up inside of you a longing and a taste that you might taste the full thing, the whole thing one day. And you know what that first fruit looks like? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. And you say, man, I want more of that. I want all of that I can get. It's an appetizer that makes you hungry for the real meal. Here's the second cry, the cry of the Christian heart. The cry of the Christian heart. Crying to be free from the broken life, this world cursed by sin, and underneath the oppression of darkness. No government's ever going to fix the world. Never going to fix it. 
you don't need a government to fix it. You need a savior. No government, no king, no president, no nothing. No council is ever going to fix it. We might improve it. We might help. We might shift here and there. It's never going to be fixed. And that's what the cry is inside the heart of every Christian. We were not created to live under the weight of this broken world. And it causes frustration. And at the point of frustration, you cry out. You say, God, when? How long? How long do we have to watch people suffer and go through this and go through the other? And then verse 26 gives us the last cry. There's the cry of creation, the cry of the Christian heart, verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray. You ever been there? Man, sometimes I pray. I walk when I pray. I I can't sit down. I get distracted. I'll be like, look over there. So I walk when I pray. Helps me focus. And sometimes I say, God, I I don't know what to say. I don't know what to pray today because I feel like I've already prayed everything I know. So you know what? I'm just going to show up. Here I am. I don't really have anything to bring, but I have myself. So here I am. I'm coming to pray. And here's what verse 26 says. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We didn't know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Through wordless groans, number three, there's the cry of the Spirit. If you're a believer, you're a temple of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit lives in you, the Holy Spirit will cry through you. He will cry to God. Now hold on, hold on. The Holy Spirit's the helper. That's what the Bible says He is. So He helps us pray when we don't know how to pray because the Spirit knows the mind of God and He knows you and He knows what's best. And he'll connect those things together and he'll groan and cry through you. Creation cries, our heart cries, the spirit cries. Watch. What what is creation and what is your heart and what is the Holy Spirit crying about? What are they saying? Let me tell you what they're saying. This is not normal. That's what they're crying. This is is not creation and your in the Christian heart and the Holy Spirit are crying. This is not normal. God had a better plan. But we drown those cries out with busyness and distraction and going here and there and pursuing material things. We drown it out. But sometimes something happens in one of our lives that gets our attention and tunes us back into that deeper cry. This time, it just so happens, it happened to the whole world. And so the pressure of COVID-19 and disruption forces a cry out of us. And just as we hear it come out of our own mouth, it opens our ears to a deeper cry that's been below that for a long time. Since creation fell, it's been crying Since you've been a believer, your heart's been crying. Since the Holy Spirit's been in you, He's been interceding through you, and He's been crying. And He's been crying out for something else. This is a deep cry in the earth, in the Spirit in your heart. What does the cry want? Here it is. If you go to Romans 8 and you back up just a few verses from where we were, Romans 8, 15, I'm going to tell you what the cry is about. Here it is. You ready? The spirit you received, here we go, here we go with freedom again, does not make you slaves. God never intended for his people to be bound to anything so that you live in fear again. That's the word we heard earlier, so that you don't live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry. God, there it is again. We cry. Abba. Abba, Father. You do that. It's so hard to translate that word Abba in English because the closest thing we have is Daddy. And don't make it weird. It's not weird. It's affectionate. It's the greatest relational connection there is anywhere in the universe. There's a spirit of adoption that God put in you that cries out, Father. 
You know what the cry of nature and the cry of you, the Christian heart and the cry of the Holy Spirit's about? It is a longing for pure connection to the Father. For uninterrupted, comprehensive, pure and clean connection to the Father. That's, that's what this cry is. More than anything else, broken creation wants its Father. And until you, until you hear that cry, you haven't heard the deepest cry. Dr. Larry Crabb wrote a book years ago called Inside Out. And in the book, he, he has a part where he talks about Ecclesiastes 3.11 that says, God has put eternity in the heart of every person. And so he says that there are three levels of desires that we feel in our life. They're surface level desires. They're things we want. There are critical desires, things we desire that we need. And then below that's one other level he calls one deep desire. So how do you find that one deep desire? How do you find that cry? Here's what he suggests. Everyday journal for a little while. Just take a blank sheet of paper, take a note on your phone, take a document on your computer and just sit down and type out every day what do you want and he said it'll go something like this you'll start typing and you'll say I want pizza I want ice cream I want, I want a promotion I want that lady at work to stop gossiping about me I want to fit in my favorite clothes which usually has something to do with the pizza and ice cream the other thing but that's what you'll write down. But, but keep writing. Because when you keep writing, the day will come you'll start to write stuff like this. I wish I had deeper friendships. I wish my family wasn't so broken. Keep going. Keep going. Keep writing. Every day, just be, don't judge your desires. Just write them. And then keep going. And then the day will come, you'll start to write things like this. And uh, uh, What will begin to emerge is a desire for God. What will begin to emerge is a spiritual desire, a spiritual appetite. You'll start to desire spiritual things. And you'll start to say things like, I, I want eternity. I want forgiveness. I want freedom. I want heaven. I want to know if God's real. I want to know where God was when this happened to me. I want to know where God was. I want to know God. I want to know His presence. I want to know His plan. I want to know His real. Your heart was made to long for God, and until you find that longing, you have not found the deepest desire of your heart because God has put eternity in your heart. Well, we got a lot to talk about in this series. I just want to, I want to end here. Would you stand with me and if you're online, would you just open your heart? Every eye closed, please. You know, even if you're at home watching or watching a replay, you know, maybe if you're by yourself, it'd be okay to close your eyes. If you want to just, I think my heart opens a little more when I close my eyes, when I can't see. Then I start to look with my heart. Look with your heart today. Maybe you're, you're watching or you're in the room and you realize there's something missing in your life. There's frustration that's built up and you don't know what to do with it. And can I just say, there's a cry rising in you for something more. And that cry is a connection with the Father. Can you hear it? Today, if you say, I want to start a real relationship with God. If you're, if you're watching online, worshiping online, I want to start a real relationship with God. In just a minute, I'll give you an opportunity to respond. If you're online, just simply go into the comment section and type, I can hear it. And when you type that, what's going to happen? Our prayer team 
who are on live right now are going to meet you there and they're going to begin to pray for you and in a minute I'm going to begin to pray with you and what's going to happen is the presence of God is going to surround you and the presence of God is going to fill you. If you're in the room and you say with every eye closed, I need today to start a real relationship with Jesus. Would you just lift your hand so I can see it and say, pray for me today. I need to start a real relationship with Jesus. I see your hand. Thank you. Just put it right back down. Just lift it up. Just lift it up. All right, let's pray together today. Dear Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I ask you to enter my heart and life and fill me with your presence. Give me hope now and help me to hear your voice and to follow you. Thank you for forgiveness and thank you for a new relationship and thank you for a new normal. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hey, if you prayed that prayer, I want you to just Drop a comment in the comment section and say, I prayed that prayer and our prayer team's gonna gonna celebrate with you and we're gonna celebrate with you. In fact, why don't we do that for all those who prayed? Why don't we just thank God for the good decision that they made today? <laughs> Grateful for what you did today. All right, now look, I, I, I know we've been a, a little longer, but here's how we're gonna end this service, okay? There's a song that talks about cry, the the breath of God singing through me. Here's what I want you to do for all you who are believers. I want you to sing it. Here's what's going to happen. When you start to sing, what's going to happen is some of that frustration that you've been walking in is going to start to come out. And that's okay. Let it out. Let it out. Because you know what's underneath it? A cry. The Holy Spirit's crying. Your Christian heart is crying. And as you begin to let it out, some of you are going to start crying when you let it out. And that's okay. It's a safe place. Some of you are going to rejoice. Some of you are going to cry. But what I want you to do is I want you to begin to let it out. Let that cry for the Father come out. Would you do that with me right now? Lord, we cry out from our own heart and we look to you for a connection. God, we look to you, the Abba Father, the Daddy God. Lord, we lift our voice, we lift our heart, we lift our words today that we might worship you and do what we were created to do. Lord, fill us now with the cry of God in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Come on, everybody. Let's begin to sing.